Hello and welcome to the third in this series of um, higher education and UCAS webinars. Um, this one is all about how you can um, begin to start making your UCAS choices. Um, as you're probably aware, you can make up to five choices, um, but those choices will determine what you are doing for the next three or four years of your life. So it's important, um, I think, uh, to go into the decision-making process uh, um, as, a, as informed as it's possible to be. Um, and that's what this webinar is for. Uh, my name is Tim and I'm one of the uh, careers team based at the college um, and I'm going to guide you through this research process today. So what we're going to be looking at today um, is uh, exploring different types of higher education and courses available. Um, we'll be looking at things like year in industry, years abroad, uh, and we'll be looking at uh, the different ways and places in which you can study. Um, We'll be looking at the questions you need to be asking yourself uh, before making any choices and ultimately what we're aiming towards is making sure that you are making the right choice. Um, as usual, um, I am contactable via email uh, which was on the previous slide, so if you do have any questions as you go along, please feel free to email me. This question of uh, the things you need to consider um, in order to make an informed choice, in order to make the right choice for you, um, is big and it can be um, uh, unnerving. Um, so what we're going to do as we go through this webinar is we're going to start breaking it down into smaller chunks. This slide here is the first of those chunks. On the screen you can see there are seven options. Things like subject, location, uh, the length of course, and we'll look at that in more detail later. Uh, but other things like sports, social and spiritual um, provision at the university, um, and whether or not you move away or home. Um, these are just the first seven things that we perhaps should be talking about and thinking about. So what I want you to do um, is to place these seven um, in order of preference. And if you click the link at the bottom of the screen, you actually can open a sheet uh, and load it. So you'll be able to print it off um, or draw lines on your tablet or, or, or whatever. So let's start with that. So we started with seven things to think about and now we've got more. We're starting to think about things like how the course uh, is made up, what its structure is. Uh, is it a vocational course? Is it practical, hands-on? Is it mainly theoretical uh, or is there time um, in the lab or workshop? Um, another thing we can start to think about is the length of the course. Um, I've mentioned already work placements in year abroad, but that can take your study from a three-year degree up to a five-year degree, um, particularly if you are uh, starting on a foundation degree or year zero. Um, how are you going to be taught? Are you going to be taught in small classes uh, like you are at college uh, or school? Um, or is it going to be in massive lecture theatres where two, three hundred people are being taught by one person um, uh, standing at the front? Um, and what's the difference uh, in that? What, uh, how will that affect your experience um, as a student? Um, one of the things uh, that we can start to think about at this point is, is employability. What can the university do to um, help you with uh, finding a job at the end of your uh, university? What skills or experiences can it give you that are going to be beneficial when it comes to you entering the graduate job market? The uh, link at the bottom of the slide, um, there's more, and um, will take you to a um, worksheet with a couple of case studies that explore some of the um, things that can happen when perhaps you don't make uh, choices for the right reasons. Um, I think it's a useful way of sort of framing um, why uh, doing your research and making informed choices is an important process. Okay, so this is where things get really complicated. Um, if you had a look at the um, 
fact sheet uh, from linked to from the uh, previous slide, you would have uh, hopefully seen Ella's and Mohammed stories. Um, these are true stories, stories that um, of students that I've worked with. And you can see in Mohammed's case, um, he didn't really pay much attention to uh, the subject he was um, uh, taking at university or how it would be taught. And he found that he didn't get the lab access that he was so really interested in doing. Um, <clears throat> Ella, on the other hand, uh, she thought she wanted uh, to live in a big city, um, but when it actually came down to it, she realised that actually she quite liked living uh, in a smaller community where she uh, had easier access to um, uh, people with similar interests to her. So these are just a couple of things that you can um, see as consequences of not paying attention when you're making your choices, which is why we start early, uh, which is why you are um, looking at this webinar. This slide is really complicated, I accept that, um, but hopefully it gives you an idea of some of the other things that you could, could and should be considering. So starting off in the top left, um, do you want to go to university uh, or might you want to do a distance learning course? You could do university courses in FE colleges um, and there are higher and degree level apprenticeships available as well. Um, Looking at the course content in the bottom right hand corner, what are you actually going to be studying? Um, if you care three different universities with three degrees um, with the same name, they can all have totally and completely different content um, coming, at a, coming at a subject from a different angle. Um, some of you might be interested in the reputation or ranking of your university do you find out about that um, some of you who are going into more professional services might need their degrees to be accredited by the professional bodies that allow you to work immediately after graduating graduating not all university courses are so these are just some of the things that um, you might want to look at and as we go through the rest of the tutorial I'll show you some of the places where you can start finding out answers to these questions. Okay so the link on this slide um, takes you to um, another fact sheet, another activity um, that's filled with lots and lots of questions. Uh, right at the top the advice is don't panic. It is a big job but it can be broken down into small chunks and you just need to think about what is the right thing for you. Starting off with the first question is what level? Are you going straight to a degree or are you interested in doing a foundation um, year first? Average hours of study. How long are you going to be in university? How much time are you going to be spending with teacher, lecturers and professors and the like? How much are you going to be expected to do on your own? Um, methods of studies. Um, are you going to be in large lectures or smaller groups more similar to your school or college? How are you going to be assessed? Um, if you're moving away from home, um, what are your accommodation options? Okay, um, are you going to be in halls? Are you going to be expected to um, find a private rented um, house or flat? Uh, the location is important. As we saw from Ella's story, uh, universities exist right in the centre of big cities, but others are out in the countryside, and then there are campus universities, which are like small self-contained um, universities um, that have everything that students need in one place, so shops, bars, restaurants, as well as libraries, labs, workshops, and lecture theatres. Um, what are the differences between them? Um, and how much will it cost you to live uh, in the various locations? Um, and there's an exercise coming up in this session um, to make you, help you work that out. Um, facilities, what are you going to have access to? If you're a scientist like Mohammed, are you going to be able to use the labs? Um, or is that going to be reserved for postgraduate and PhD students? Um, how good is the university? How do you measure it? Uh, what kind of results do they get? What kind of graduate opportunities? Uh, what kind of work do their graduates go on to? Um, are there any additional costs involved um, in your course, um, particularly in the creative arts? I'm thinking fashion um, and uh, art and design. Uh, there can be um, additional costs, materials you're gonna need in order to complete your course. How are you gonna fund them? And the last thing um, that I've put on here, there are others, but the last thing that's included on this list is about employer links. What, who does the university work with? Where, 
um, have we, will you have opportunities to go on placements? Um, all of these things can be found on the university website. So on this sheet, I've um, included three examples. So click on those links um, and have a look around on the websites and see if you can try and answer all of these questions. Some websites are more detailed than others, um, but all of them should be able to give you um, a pretty good start um, on answering some of the questions presented um, in this list and on the slides um, that we've previously seen. Okay, so now that we've seen how complicated a task this can be, um, I think it's pretty important that um, I try and kind of um, reassure you all um, and give you a really good place to start. The, fact, um, the reality is um, you have five choices. You don't need to find your perfect course. You can find five perfect courses, five courses that you will feel happy about the prospect of spending the next three, four, or even five years of your life study in there um <clears throat> so where can we start well on this slide you will see a link to ucast.com explore that is as good a place as any to start um, and if you click on it um it will present you with lots of questions um, and lots of um, activities uh, so things that you can try and start figuring out the answers to the questions we've uh, posed already so far um, some things to consider right from the get-go. Um, what do you want to study? Uh, do you want to continue studying what you're studying now? Have you always had an idea of what it was that you were going to study at university? Or do you want to try something new? Um, do you want to stay close to home? Do you want to stay, uh, go to your local university and commute in every day? Um, or do you want to travel somewhere else in the country? Um, again, if you live in a small town or village now, do you want to live in a big city? If you live in a big city now, would you rather spend some time in the countryside or on a campus university? Um, how do you want to study? Full-time, part-time? Um, distance and online options are available, um, particularly during lockdown. Um, what's the difference between all of these various options? Um, the UCAS.com Explore uh, site that I've linked to on this slide is a really good place to start and uh, will allow you to start doing your research, record it all um, so that you can return to it later and you can start narrowing down some of the hundreds if not thousands of choices you have at the beginning of this process. As I've said throughout this uh, webinar so far, um, you literally have hundreds if not thousands of options available to you at the beginning of this process. Um, and I've shown you some of the things you should be considering. Um, but f what we're going to start doing now is start looking at some uh, realistic first steps that you can make to really start narrowing down those choices. And the first place we're going to start is entry requirements. All universities have entry requirements, um, grades that you will need to achieve um, in order to be uh, offered a place at the university for the course you want to study. This is where you need to be realistic about how you're studying right now. Um, some universities are very competitive, some are less competitive. All of them, um, as I say, have minimum requirements, grades you will need to achieve um, in order to be uh, offered a place on these courses. Um, you need to be realistic about your studying. If you're currently uh, getting uh, merits uh, or um, Cs, uh, in A-level, uh, and the university you're looking at requires A's, in the time you've got less left, um, are you realistically going to be able to up your grades in order to meet those higher um, um, entry requirements? If you are, then great, go for it. Go for the more competitive universities. If you're not, look at slightly less competitive universities. Um, because you've got five choices, um, I think a good sort of way of breaking those down is one, reach your dream university, uh, three, three universities where you're confident of meeting the grades that you need um, and have one um, as an insurance, a backup, just in case uh, things change over the next uh, 12 months, the final year of your course.
So what do these entry requirements um, look like? As you look through university websites, you'll see two main types of entry requirements and how they're detailed. The first one is UCAS points, um, and I'll explore what UCAS points um, mean um, in a little while. Um, and the other one is um, grades. So if you look at the two courses on the screen, one's at Sheffield Hallam, one's at University of Sheffield um, Hallam. Um, it requires um, 112 uh, UCAS points, whereas University of Sheffield requires AAB. Now, the difference between UCAS points and grades is that there's more flexibility in UCAS points. There are lots of different ways that you could make up 112 UCAS points. Um, it suggests that you could get a BBC at A level or DMM at uh, BTEC, but if you've done a range of courses, maybe a couple of A levels, and now you're doing um, a BTEC, say a subsidiary diploma, you can add all those grade points up. Um, and to, if you hit 112, you have met the requirements. With the University of Sheffield grade system, um, it tends to be uh, non negotiable. Um, you need to get AA. B. Now, some universities for some courses will stipulate that within those grades you have to have certain goods in um, certain subjects. So for engineering or something, they might require that you need to have a B uh, in maths. So if you're not doing maths, um, you are never going to meet the entry requirements, even if you get AAB. Um, all of them will have a GCSE requirement of English and maths. Uh, some courses will have a GCSE requirement of science as well, and I'm thinking particularly of healthcare professionals, so nursing or midwifery or um, other uh, healthcare professional courses. Um, some will require, particularly the most competitive courses, some will require you have achieved a certain number of GCSEs at a certain grade. So certainly for the most competitive medicine courses or dentistry courses, um, you are looking at needing to have at least um, six to eight GCSEs, usually at the highest grades. Um, all of this information is available on the university website um, on each individual degree page, uh, there will be uh, details of the specific entry requirements um, and what you need to achieve um, in order to be made an offer for a place on that course. Um, if you were looking at uh, the previous slide and thinking, oh, I'm never going to meet those entry requirements, I'll never make it to university, um, I just want to talk to you um, a little while about uh, foundation years. Um, as you will have known from the previous webinar, uh, foundation years are like a year zero. They're a year to consolidate your learning and to fill in any gaps or to introduce you to a new subject area you've not previously studied before. And the entry requirements tend to be much, much lower. So this is criminology and at um, Sheffield Hallam, but it includes a foundation year. So instead of the 112 UCAS points that it needed uh, before, you now only need to achieve 64 UCAS points. Um, obviously, this is much lower and much easier to um, attain. Um, but you need to be um, conscious of the fact that the GCSE requirement rem quite remains exactly the same. You still will need a C grade four um, at GCSE in both English language and maths. Now this is universal. All universities will insist on that minimum requirement of English and maths at GCSE. Um, before we move on from uh, entry requirements, I thought it'd be useful just to share with you um, just a quick guide on how UCAS points um, are worked out. What UCAS points are is basically um, a system that has been created so that two different um, qualifications can be compared. Um, so on the screen, you'll see the difference between A-levels and B-techs. Um, so an A-star at um, uh, A-level is worth 56 points. So of course you would do three um, A-levels, you get three A-stars, you get um, 168 points, which is the same as three distinction stars um, at a BTEC extended diploma. Um, and as you go down the various grades in A-level, the point allocation um, goes down, um, as it does with BTECs. Now, UCAS points have been worked out for pretty much every qualification um, in the world, as far as I can tell. And the link on this page takes you to calculator so that if you have done a range of um, different sort 
courses at different subjects um, at different points in your life you can put them all in and figure out exactly how many UCAS points you have earned um, in your um, education um, up to now which makes it much easier to um, work out whether or not you have met the entry requirements for universities that use UCAS points as I said in the previous slides uh, if it's a university that uses grades um, there is much less uh, flexibility you need to achieve achieve the grades that they are asking for. Um, if you were looking at uh, the previous slide and thinking, oh, I'm never going to meet those entry requirements, I'll never make it to university, um, I just want to talk to you um, a little while about uh, foundation years. Um, as you will have known from the previous webinar, uh, foundation years are like a year zero. They're a year to consolidate your learning and to fill in any gaps or to introduce you to a new subject area you've not previously studied before. And the entry requirements tend to be much, much lower. So this is criminology and at um, Sheffield Hallam, but it includes a foundation year. So instead of the 112 UCAS points that it needed uh, before, you now only need to achieve 64 UCAS points. Um, obviously, this is much lower and much easier to um, attain. Um, but you need to be um, conscious of the fact that the GCSE requirement rem quite remains exactly the same. You still will need a C grade four um, at GCSE in both English language and maths. Now this is universal. All universities will insist on that minimum requirement of English and maths at GCSE. I wanted to study Human Resource Management at Leeds because it's a vocational course and that's something that I wanted to do because I wanted to go straight into being employable, getting my employability ratings up. At Leeds it's the IPD accredited, which for me was the main driver to choose this university. I took part in the Nurturing Talent Mentor Scheme, which I started in my first year of university. And for me, it was a scheme that actually put you in contact with the real life business world, which was extremely useful. In my experience on year industry, which was at L'Oreal, um, so I moved down to London for starters, which for me was a change from Leeds, never lived down there before. When I was at L'Oreal, tutor came to see me there, asking us if we were okay. They were always like, overseeing how we are, um, which was really nice, and making sure we're getting on well as well. The responsibility I had was huge, which changed me into a professional. I even had the comment from a feedback from the HR director of L'Oreal. They said, the girl that's leaving is very, very different to the person that's actually, you know, that came into the doors. And I felt that as well, which for me is like a massive sense of achievement. Being in that environment taught me obviously how to manage myself, how to behave as well. And it taught me so many skills that I've like, taken to interviews this year for grad schemes. My plan for Future Now and after graduation is that I have secured a graduate scheme of Morrison's as a people manager. Over the years of studying at the business school, I've sort of generated this package that you know, everyone along the way has helped me with. And I chose Leeds because of employability, which for me, you know, I've built it. And securing Morrison's, absolutely over the moon. I can't believe it. It's incredible. Okay, so that video was about um, students that chose to take a year in industry or an extended work placement. Um, and uh, I personally think that the uh, year in industry or extended work placements are some of what was some of the most useful time you will spend at university um, and I worked with one student in particular um, who went to university and he did his first two years and then he decided to take a year in industry so extend his um, study by um, an additional year and he went to work for a small company he was involved in um, product design and uh, things like that um, and he did it uh, his work placement he was paid while he was there um, and he did did really really well and he went back and he finished his degree and after graduating he was um, offered a job um, he wasn't offered a job um, by the company where he'd done his placement um, although I think they probably would have employed him uh, had they got there in time. He was actually employed by one of that company's competitors. Um, and th he told me that they told him when they approached him that would rather they'd been so impressed by watching him work that they would rather have him working for them than against them. And I think that is um, the uh, key thing to um, extended work placements and year in industry opportunities that you can get at university. Um, it is the best way that I can think of to start beginning to build your professional profile and your professional network. By working in the industry, you are uh, 
figuring out how that industry works. You are meeting people, you are making contacts. Um, it is the best way um, to kickstart um, your professional presence um, in whatever industry that you um, are interested in working in. So after watching that video, um, and there's another one following about uh, spending um, a year abroad, um, some of the things you might want to consider are, what are the advantages um, for you? What might be the costs? Now, obviously, it's going to add an additional year to your study. Um, you don't pay full fees, but there will still be some costs, um, even whilst you're working. But then you will be paid, usually for placements. Um, what difference might it make to your overall experiences um, and the things that you will take from university out into the job market um, how would it benefit you um, if you find that the answers to these questions are largely positive then I would greatly recommend um, exploring the options now many universities um, actually list courses that include year in industry or include study abroad um, but even those that don't or if you can't find one in your subject area um, talk to the universities um, and see if it's possible to arrange once you've enrolled Hi, I'm Rianne. I studied media at Sheffield Hallam and a part of my course I studied abroad uh, for six months in Australia. So here are my reasons why you should study abroad. One of the amazing things that is good about studying abroad is being in a new culture. It's completely different to Sheffield. New people, new way for me to, you know, develop myself and just put myself in a new situation. So another amazing thing uh, about Sydney Road is just making new friends there. So when I arrived in Australia, I was already um, set up with, uh, with people that arrived there as well, so I made new friends there. Just the university as well, where I was, offered like events and trips and sort of like my accommodation. So wherever I was, there was like opportunities for me to make friends. Another amazing skill that you can have is learning a new language. When you're in a new country that needs you to um, learn a new language, if you're already studying that language, you can apply that in a more practical way. So being in a new environment, um, especially in a new country, I found it quite overwhelming at first, but eventually I was able to develop myself and able to test my ability to adapt to those situations and learn about the new culture as well. When you've come back from home from studying abroad, um, you've already got, gained so many skills like willingness to learn, being able to adapt to new um, environments and those look really good on a CV. They are attractive to future employers. Like for me, when I came back home, it just opened up so many opportunities for me to take. You should take the opportunity to travel the world, even if it's studying abroad or even if it's a placement. Um, it's an experience like no other. So I think you should go ahead and take this opportunity. Another key decision you can make um, that helps narrow down the hundreds and or thousands of choices that you've got at the beginning of this process is where you want to study. So that can be um, as simple a question as, I want to stay at home, I want to be a commuter student, someone that travels from um, my home, my family home uh, to university on the days that I need to go in. And there are advantages to that. Um, any part-time work you're currently doing, um, you could can probably continue doing. Um, it does uh, bring your cost of living down because um, you won't be paying rent or probably not as much rent as you would even in um, but there are some disadvantages as well and some students have found that uh, by remaining um, at home they are missing out on uh, the university experience. Um, others have reported that they don't really feel that they are fully um, uh, involved or fully immersed in the university life but they also feel that they're no longer fully involved in their um, lives of um, growing up either. Uh, they kind of exist between two worlds. Um, if you want to move away from home, and there are universities the length and breadth of this country, um, 
there are things you consider, as I've mentioned before, the universities in big cities, there are campus universities, um, and there are more rural uh, universities, smaller ones uh, that tend to be uh, out in the countryside uh, or on the coast. Um, mm -hmm. All of these things um, are available, um, and it's down to you to do some research um, and explore what options are available. To you. Um, there's a link on this slide um, to a, another fact sheet where you can start exploring some of these ideas. We're now going to look at um, costs of living. Um, obviously, one of the ways that you might decide um, as to where you want to look at studying um, is how much it's going to cost you to live there. And it's pretty safe to assume that big cities like London, Manchester, Leeds even, um, are going to be more expensive than smaller towns or smaller cities. Um, universities out in the countryside could equally be cheaper, but it could also be more expensive. Um, so what I want you to look at now is just um, the uh, universities on the um, screen and I want you to have a think about which ones you think are the most expensive and the cheapest to live. Now remember some of these universities are in cities, some are rural and some are campus. Um, the information has come from totalmoney.com uh, and their survey of cost of living for students uh, which I've linked to on this page. So have a think and the next slide um, we'll talk about why um, the results are what they are. Did you get them right? Now, it surprised me when I found this, but Warwick is actually, of those universities, the uh, cheapest um, university to live. Why is that, do you think? Well, I think it's probably because it's a campus university, because it's not in a big city, um, it's been custom built. Um, so they have unlimited space. The problem with city universities is that they exist in a space and compete for space um, in already overcrowded cities. That tends to drive um, the cost of land up and the cost of rent up, which means that your accommodation may be more expensive. Um, it can be more expensive to go and have a meal um, or to get a drink. Um, it can be more expensive to get around the city. Warwick um, is a self-contained, it's like a small town. Everything that you need is walkable or cyclable um, to and from, so that brings your cost of living down. Everything's in one place, so the distances you have to cover aren't very um, expensive. Now, this survey looked at everything from cost, um, from the rent you'll pay to the price of a pint um, to the cost of a taxi home after a night out. If you're at Warwick, your bars, your restaurants, your nightclubs are all on campus. You can walk home. Um, Unsurprisingly, I think uh, the most expensive um, on that list is Leeds. Um, it's considerably more expensive than Manchester. Why is that? Uh, Leeds City Centre uh, is small and self-contained uh, and the university um, is uh, bang in the centre. Manchester is a bit more sprawly. Um, it's an older university. Perhaps uh, its buildings were uh, built and paid for um, before um, the price of city centre real estate went up. Um, there are other reasons as well, and uh, if you click on the link on the previous slide, um, it will explore. You can explore um, the reasons and how they worked out which are the cheapest and most expensive universities to live in. So I think it's important to consider. Um, most of you will um, be living on your maintenance lanes, and these are capped, they are not unlimited. Uh, so the more expensive um, it is to live in a city wherever you choose to go to university, um, the further you've got to make that money stretch um, or else you're going to need to find part-time work uh, in order to sort of make up any differences. It's all very well and good me talking about uh, the different types of university, but it's not me that's got to make the decision about where you're going to spend the next three, four or even five years of your life. Um, it's going to be down to you and what feels right for you. So how can you start figuring out um, what uh, a university is really like? Um, you may have visited um, a city um, as a tourist, um, but that's a different experience to actually living there um, and spending a considerable amount of time there. Now, under normal circumstances, what I would be saying at this point is go to open days. Go to open days, go to open days, go to open days. They are the best way to get a feel for what a university is like and to get 
quest answers to the questions that you have that I can't even possibly imagine. Um, but during lockdown, obviously, this is um, a bit more difficult. So what many universities have done um, is actually started producing virtual openings. Now, these could be as simple as a, a campus tour, which would be uh, an edited video, um, but many offer um, the opportunity to interact with um, students and tutors and um, people within the city. So you can get a real feel for what it's like. Um, they'll show you around the accommodation you can ask questions about the accommodation. So on this slide, um, I've linked to a list of um, online uh, virtual open days uh, that's compiled by UCAS. Um, it's constantly updated, um, so you should be able to find um, some kind of uh, virtual event uh, for your chosen university. Um, the second link um, is a, it gives you the opportunity, opportunity to talk to real students. Um, it is uh, also run by UCAS and it just puts um, prospective students in touch with current students so that you can ask your questions about what the courses are like, what the food in the cafeteria is like, what the nightlife is like, whatever it is that you are interested in, um, you can ask current students what their reality is. Um, the tip uh, links to a worksheet um, that if you do get um, to a virtual open day where you're um, able to ask questions of people, it gives you some ideas of the kinds of things that you might want to ask um, and get answers to help you better make an informed choice about your university options. Okay, so in the final part of this um, webinar, um, I want to start bringing all this together. So far, I have uh, spoken about all the things you might want to ask. Um, and just to wrap things up, I want to show you some of the places where you might start beginning to find answers. Um, so if you click on the Activity 3 link, um, it downloads um, another worksheet. And what I want you to do is uh, to ask yourself and write down four questions that you want the answer to. Um, and where you might, uh, where you feel you might find the answers to it. And then on the next slide, I'm going to show you some um, resources uh, that I use to help narrow down university choices when I'm working with students. Um, and then hopefully by looking at those and spending some time on the internet, um, you'll be able to find the answers to the questions that are most important to you. So on this slide, we've got five different sites, five places that collate university information um, and present it in a way that hopefully will allow you to start drilling down into the questions that you are you find important um, and you can start narrowing down the thousands of choices you've currently got um, to the five you will ultimately choose. Um, I spoke a little bit earlier about the ranking and reputation of universities um, and on this site, uh, the on this slide, sorry, the Guardian and the Complete University Guide rank all of uh, the UK's universities um, by subject, um, overall and by subject. So if you're interested in journalism, you can go to the Guardian site, use the drop down menu to um, find journalism courses, and it will tell you that in uh, which university, in their opinion, are the best universities, and it gives scores for various things like teaching and student experience and all that kind of stuff. Um, the Complete University Guide um, does a very similar thing, but it has its own methodology. Um, and in my experience, it actually has more um, categories of courses, so it's easier to find the subject you're specifically interested in in the Complete University Guide than it is on the Guardian. Uh, the Guardian tends to group things together in quite broad subject areas. Uh, the one in the middle at the, on the top line uh, is the Times Higher Education. Um, that gives a ranking, um, but it's uh, it's useful for UK universities, but it's uh, also a global university ranking. So you can see where your university um, uh, compares to, I don't know, a university in America or Canada or Hong Kong or somewhere. Um, but for the UK specifically, uh, the Guardian and the Complete University Guide, particularly by subject, um, are where I usually start.
Um, the link in the middle um, is Glover Uni. Now, this is a site run by the government. Um, it used to be called Uni Stats, um, and you may have come across that before. And what it allows you to do is compare universities by what real students um, think of pretty much any aspect of uh, university life. So again, teaching, um, food, support, um, uh, how responsive uh, ac the academic staff are, all that kind of thing. And what it does is every year the government issues a survey to students either at university or recently graduated. Um, and it compiles um, the statistics and creates um, a database that you can search and it allows you to compare um, course by course, university by university, uh, what real students are saying about uh, their studies and their time at university, um, which could help you inform your choices. Uh, the one at the bottom is UCAS, which I've already mentioned a few times. Um, it's a great way of um, exploring what's available, um, but unlike the others, it doesn't make any judgment um, about um, whether one is better than the other. It just presents uh, all available options um, to you um, and allows you to have a look around. These sites link to um, the university website so you can drill down even further and really start getting to uh, the nuts and bolts of uh, what it is you're going to be doing for the next couple of years. Um, so what I'm going to do now is um, I'm just going to uh, present to you um, a short video um, about how you might use uh, one of these sites um, and uh, hopefully that will give you um, a clue and uh, as to how to get started so that you can get going on your own independent research. Okay, so I'm just going to show you very briefly uh, how you can use some of the tools that uh, we looked at in the previous slide. So I'm going to click on um, the Guardian um, search site first and I'll show you what it looks like. Uh, for this exercise, um, I've decided that I want to study business, okay? And I'm just going to look at various sites. So you can see that all of these universities are the top ranked, um, but then you can use the drop down to select the subject that you are interested in. So scroll down until we find business. It'll reorder the list and you can see uh, which are the best ones. Now at the same time, I'm going to use complete universities. I'm going to open a new tab. Um, and do a similar search for business. So you just use the drop down menus and select the subject that you're interested in. Right, we scroll down and you can see that the University of St. Andrews is the top ranked business on that site uh, and it uh, and is the second top, uh, top on the Guardian site. So you can see they've got different methodologies for ranking their universities. So I'm going to look at a university nearer to home, so Leeds, and I'm going to select um, a subject from the course. And you click on the link and it takes you to the website. Go back to the complete university and I'm going to stroll down to Warwick because we discovered earlier that that was one of the cheaper universities uh, to live. Click on the link and it will display all of the courses that are delivered at that university. So I'm interested in um, international business. Uh, but I'm not interested in the language, so I'm going to scroll to the next page. When it opens the link. And try again. And here we are, we can take us to the second page and uh, we're looking at uh, management with a foundation year. Back at the Guardian. Oh no, here we go, the international business degree. 
and it can, you can see here that it shows us um, the entry requirements um, and um, So here we are, I'm just comparing two sets of entry requirements. This is set to A-levels, but if you click the drop down, um, it'll show So that's the end of the uh, webinar um, for now. Um, and I appreciate I have uh, presented a lot of information. I've asked an awful lot of questions and I've asked you to look at um, an awful lot of online resources. Um, but it really is the only way to make sure that you are making an informed choice rather than just sticking a pin in thin air and going that one um it is the next three years or four years of your life not my life not your mum's life not your girlfriend or boyfriend's life not your mate's life um so i think it's really really important that you uh, are confident that when you put down your five choices in cast that it is done so from a position of knowledge rather than um panic and the only way to do that is to put in the hours, is to spend the time on the internet um, and do your research. Um, I'm always contactable via email. My email is on the screen right now. Uh, the final thing I would like to say is good luck with your research. You've got plenty of time to do it. Um, and um, I wish you well in your um, research. Thank you for listening.